Welcome to STEPS, a staff training program run by the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to this step session on plagiarism and the PhD. Particularly, I wanted to talk about plagiarism culture and how we avoid it in the doctoral program. Plagiarism has never been easier to do and it's also never been easier to detect. So I'm going to talk about why plagiarism is still an issue in our doctoral program and how we as supervisors can manage it. I'll also explore with you the signs that I look for as an examiner and what I check for as an examiner when I'm exploring plagiarism in a PhD. Now, intriguingly, I've had more requests for this session than just about any topic, and that's from students as much as from supervisors. So I wanted to try and explore this session, and it will be the first of probably a few in this area, but I wanted to explore this first session on plagiarism in the PhD in a way that's relaxed and contextualized, but also practical. Most of us, when we're explaining what digitization, computing, the internet, the web, the read white web have added to our lives, we respond with those sort of verby nouns, efficiency, productivity, connectivity. What is rarely mentioned, and one of the causes of this efficiency, is that an array of functions in our daily lives are now automated. That means they're displaced from our patterns of conscious decision making. So in the old days, <laughs> we would read a book and take analog notes with a pen and a notebook, and that was careful, and it was considered, and it was slow. Now we read on a computer screen, we take notes on a computer screen through cutting and pasting, and that's of course quick and easy, but sometimes pretty sloppy. So we think we're saving time, but of course we're actually cutting corners, and that has some consequences. So when I enrolled at the University of Western Australia in Perth for my first degree, there was no mention in the entire degree, no mention at all, of plagiarism. There were whispers about academics ripping off the work of their dissertation students, certainly, mm-hmm. But compare that situation to our present. Now, I've run inductions for new students from first year through to doctoral students since 1997, and each year plagiarism has crept further and further up the agenda of these inductions. So picture the scenario. Students have worked their guts out to get into a university, and finally they're free to open up a new chapter of their lives. And what do we do with them on their first day? Well, within one hour of their arrival, instead of speaking of their hopes and dreams and congratulating them on their achievements and wishing them well, we shove the sanctions against plagiarism so aggressively down their throats that they almost choke. We never think that maybe, just maybe, we've created the problem that we most fear by replacing teaching and learning and supervising with blaming and shaming. Turnitin is the panopticon of plagiarism. It certainly manages plagiarism, it certainly catches, and it censors the cheaters. But have we missed something in this story? And indeed, have we missed the actual story? And that's why I recommend that we as supervisors and our students use Turnitin as a diagnostic to help information literacy rather than using it as a punishment. So why in the last 25 years has plagiarism moved from relatively invisible to a key scholarly crime in our universities and particularly our doctoral programs? Now, I've often argued that plagiarism is a proxy, a strategy to blame the victim rather than consider what has happened to higher education in the last 20 years. So we're now living with the consequences of quick and cheap fixes for teaching and learning in the last two decades. So how does this impact on us? Well, 
For me, I think there are five issues or challenges or shortcuts for us to manage in doctoral supervision. The key variable for all of us to consider in supervision is the role of speed. Most acts of plagiarism are not intentional. They emerge from taking shortcuts, letting the technology determine the behaviour rather than information literacy shaping the behaviour. So let's talk about these five issues for us to think about and how they impact on you as a supervisor and how they impact on your students and how they are examined. Let's start with number one, cutting and pasting. Now, note taking is a specialist skill. Too often, I think, digitization enables us to take shortcuts via cut and paste cut and paste and of course the problem is that the cutting and the pasting of the words of others into a thesis occurs when our students are tired which for a doctoral student is most of the time so they start to lose track of what is their words and what's the quotation and what's a paraphrase so the shortcut the cut and paste creates sloppiness and also creates trouble so we need to be aware of it. And that's why I always recommend taking notes on a different platform from the one we are reading on. Let me explain. So I'm reading something on paper, whether it be a paper book or an article, and I'm placing notes from that paper onto my computer. Or I use the iPad in Google Scholar articles, and then I take notes onto a computer. And working the interfaces in that way creates space for thought, slowing down reading, interpretation, and yes, note-taking. Second point for our consideration, watch the brackets. Harvard referencing, I think, poses particular challenges. It encourages paraphrasing, and it means that the line between paraphrasing and independent interpretation is often unclear. As an examiner... I'm on plagiarism alert during a PhD when I see one thing. I see a paragraph of writing from a student with a Harvard bracket reference at the end of that paragraph. So here are 10 sentences, then bracket, Brabazon, 2016, end of bracket. Now I see that, I immediately go, right, there's a problem here, and I start doing a plagiarism check because the student has not specified what is the cited scholar's work, what is the PhD student's interpretation of the featured scholar, and indeed, what is the original interpretation from the student that arches beyond the researcher. So we have to check our students and that they really grasp the difference between paraphrasing and plagiarism. This, for me, is the biggest problem. We have to specify what is the paraphrase and put that bracketed reference right there, or indeed put a footnote right there then move on to the interpretation and never, ever, ever position a bracketed reference at the end of a paragraph. Three, manage feedback, editing and drafting. It is so important that we write and draft on both paper and screens because we see different kinds of errors through the distinct drafting processes on diverse platforms. So if we use both screens and paper, it keeps our relationship with the drafting process fresh and continues to defamiliarize our relationship with our students' writing. So we pick up new errors and improve arguments. Now, I know reading on paper takes longer. It is more thorough, though, than reading on a screen. And there are many reasons for that. At its most basic, a screen is a different shape to an A4 piece of paper. So examiners are able to evaluate paragraph construction and the development of ideas in a much more fluid fashion. And that's why I continue to draft on paper, because you can see the flow of arguments much more effectively. So an A4 bit of paper is bigger than a screen. And so we can monitor the flow of ideas. We also have to recognize what screens do to our reading and our note-taking. And I know through a series of JISC studies, the screen encourages specific and superficial reading practices. What happens is, and this is done through eye eye tracking software, eyes roll over the text rather than read and engage with words deeply. The study has shown that when we read on a screen, our eyes go in a circular motion. So we tend to read in circles, whereas when we read on a piece of paper, we read left to right. So as you can see, superficiality is really the enemy of a PhD research program and also research note taking. So make sure the students are moving between different platforms to do their reading. Four, orientations and inductions really do matter. 
It is really important at the start of a doctorate that a clear diagnostic is done. And really, it's never too late to do that diagnostic. Students and supervisors need to be really honest and need to have that honest and compassionate discussion of the skills that they hold and the skills that they may require. Now, this may be understanding in greater depth a bit of software like EndNote, and we explore and work with our extraordinary library and librarians. It may be about writing skills and therefore use the Office of Graduate Research. We have a Write Skills program. We have a Write Bunch program. But also referencing skills. Again, these are great sessions that are available from our librarians. And whether we're dealing with methods or theories, go to as many sessions and seminars as possible in our different disciplines and in our colleges. So only when we know what we don't know can we fix it. So we need to make sure those diagnostics are in place and we know what our students do not know. Five, keep the reading level high. Since I've come back to Australia, to be honest with you colleagues, this is the one area that worries me a great deal. There's never been a time when there's more low quality material available for our students to read. Now, the problem is that the low quality source material really creates high quality scholarship. So when I'm examining theses these days, particularly, can I say from Australia, I see far too many low quality references. I see stuff from textbooks. What is going on? I see stuff from blogs, non-refereed material, grey literature. Now, I'm not saying don't use this material. It's good to use a diversity of material, but we need to create a balance. And I need to see that the student is using high quality material to create a quality doctorate. So we need to see that the student is reading material that will stretch them, that they are reading material that they find difficult. Now, it's very easy to read blogs and textbooks. They're not the foundation of a PhD. And of course, remember, Turnitin discovers errors that they have seen on their database. And these errors are very easy to find if the student is using textbooks or blogs of any kind. The match will come up almost immediately. So we need to make sure that the reading material is complex and it is important to ensure that we keep the standards of our PhDs high. Now, I've talked a lot about the dumbing down of the doctorate, and it is true. I only took this job because I believe that we will lose the entirety of why university matters if we reduce the quality of the PhD. The PhD is our last stand to maintain standards. So I need to make sure that our students are supported to develop high-level information literacy skills, we read the best scholarship in the world, and we write the best scholarship in the world. PhDs are meant to be tough, and that is why the PhD is still an elite qualification. So thank you so much for working with me on this step, and I look forward to further professional development in this area. Thank you for listening to this STEPS training program on behalf of the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University.